the Lord said, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you won't partake of her plagues. He called her the daughter of Babylon, and he called another place the daughter of Babylon. If you discern this spiritually, you're going to extract the truth. You're going to see it with your eyes. You're going to say, ah, that's why it must take place. That's why things are happening the way they are, and it won't make you sad. That's just like a person who is in sin, and a lot of people are saying, oh, I'm so sad. I'm so hurt for the people who won't make it. If you could see what they really are, you wouldn't be hurt. At the very end, you're going to see who they are, and you will not be hurt. You won't be hurt at all. See, right now, you don't know who's going and who does not. So naturally, you might see a good person of whom the Lord has touched. He has just not given increase yet. One man sows a seed. One man may water a seed. It is always God that gives the increase. He determines when something grows and takes root and grows. Nobody else determines that. There are plenty of folks that look terrible right now. But I can assure you that God will grant the increase to them also, and they will spring forth. They'll be strong and do exploits. But there are a lot of people who will drain you by way of sympathy, who never did belong to the living God. You're going to find out that you were friends with things on this earth and there was no way you could tell the difference. God made it that way on purpose. That makes your walk an honest walk. An honest walk is when you actually make your own choices. That's what an honest walk is. That means no one is forcing you to walk good or to walk evil. But you are in fact choosing by what you are on the inside. See, if you're deceived, normally you follow an evil path. God says no one that belongs to him will ever remain deceived. Just like he said, my sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. So no one who truly belongs unto Christ Jesus is going to be led astray by another voice. You may go down the wrong exit here and there because of your interest, but as far as your faith, you're not going to follow somebody outside of the fold if you truly belong in because you were sent here to hear his voice, the sanctuary. The cities of this earth, the nations of this earth are to be given over to the rule of the saints. You're the ones that will undergo a transition and rule and reign with Christ. The saints of the Most High are going to possess the kingdoms of this earth for a thousand years. The saints of the Most High will have these kingdoms. Not the heathen, not the unbelievers, but the saints of the Most High. And that begins the beginning of the end end. So in fact, you're being fortified to withstand everything. And those who have left are coming back anyway to rule and reign with Christ here a thousand years. So after a great struggle, a great war, after all this, you guys are being fortified, fortified to stand as kings and priests. You can see that Revelation chapter 5, where God has made us, it says God has made us kings and priests. How awesome is that? It's right before the seals were opened that that was given. All these things happening in the world are performing something. Remember the three unclean spirits are also at work and their job is by any means to draw everybody down to the valley of decision. You're walking through an echo, a path already established by the living God under Christ just for you, that you experience what darkness and light is, that you may learn to choose and learn to obey. The revealing of Jesus Christ gives closure to this whole book of faith, but it also brings this book into the realm of reality. For the most part, people have interpreted this book the opposite of what God said. The Word of God must be discerned spiritually. But for the most part, we have logically tried to understand the Word of God, which is why people have a thousand different ways they interpret things. There are not a thousand interpretations of the Word of God that are right. So that means somebody has always been right and the others have been wrong. God said, none of us know all things in part. None of us know all things. We're given the truth in part. Once we are together, working in tandem, in unity, as a whole, we have that truth. We can see clear, just like your eyes. One of your eyes sees different. The left eye sees different than the right eye. That gives you what's called depth. Without depth, you cannot judge distance. When you read the Bible logically, you have no depth perception, no season perception. If you read this word and apply only spiritual things to it, only those spiritual things that you think are spiritual to it, yet you have not been inclusive with the experiences you have gained in the word of God, you're seeing it by another angle solely and have no depth. But God gave some of us a spiritual eye, and some of us, he gave that eye of realism. Still spiritual, but they can see the spirit in operation in the world. You get both those together. You then can see the distance of something properly. You cannot see distance properly with one eyeball shut. 
You can't do it. If you don't believe that, shut one eyeball. Put something on your tabletop, your bed, wherever the case may be, that you have to reach out and get it. Shut one of your eyes and try and reach out and grab a pencil, a piece of paper, the corner of your book or something of that nature, and watch what happens. It is uncomfortable. It is goofy by all degrees because you have no depth perception. You don't know if it's close or far, and you can't make a proper calculation for distance. But with both of your eyes, you can see depth, a whole nother dimension. Faith is the same way. When you start seeing the Word of God by way of the Spirit, you discern it by way of the Spirit. You are, in fact, seeing it from two true angles. I call it the angle of decree and the angle of witness. God does everything that way, even the two witnesses. Why would he have two witnesses? Because they both viewed something in two different ways, giving them complete vision. Your vision is incomplete with one eye. It is complete with two eyes. One day we'll yield to the Father's Word see how all this will be figured out for us. We'll find it be so simple, not complicated, not difficult to learn, not any of those things. The Word of God is so simplistic in nature that it bypasses us. Revelation 5, the book. When he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne, who did? The Lamb did. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, giving every one of them harps and golden fires full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, giving honor and glory unto the Lord. Revelation 5.13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and as such that are in the sea and all that are in the heard I say blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. The four beasts said amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped them that liveth forever and ever. That was the summary of chapter 5, but in particular that one of the emphasis in chapter 5 are these descriptions of the Lamb with seven horns. Because we know the dragon also has seven horns likewise. He has seven horns. And we know that the beast has additional horns. But the dragon has seven. Why seven? Well, Satan was a covering cherub, was he not? Cherubim have a specific duty, a job that deals with the nations of this earth with mankind. I've noticed throughout the Bible that having seven horns or horn period is almost always associated with a group of people, an entire nation of people. Then, of course, we go into the seals. And when the seals are open, Jesus, of course, opens the seals, which unleashes devastations upon this earth. So we have the Lamb of the seven horns, which are the seven horns. Now, it's good to know these components. But those seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The seven horns and seven eyes are the spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. With a look at Lucifer and his seven horns, and then when you look at the beast and what they represent, and you're mindful of the lamb with his seven horns, you start to see something maybe you didn't see before. The dragon has seven horns. The horns were explained to be kings or kingship, royalty, with seven horns. But for the dragon, it was not spiritual, it was natural. So the dragon, these things are built into the dragon, seven horns on those seven heads, right? The beast, however, has additional horns, additional kings. So there's a kingship. Now, if those seven horns and seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth, who do they govern? Seven churches, correct? And seven angels are appointed over these seven churches, but not only limited to the churches, but they are in fact God's spirit is power and authority, is it not? Here we have the dragon also, which has seven horns. Now remember, Satan was a covering chair. Remember when Christ said, I beheld Lucifer when he fell, fell from lightning, or felt what looked like lightning falling. The dragon himself, that old serpent called the devil, his description is a thing having seven heads, ten horns for the dragon, seven for the lamb with the seven spirits of God. Totally complete. Satan has ten horns. Seven heads, ten horns. He does not have eyes all over the place. So he's not all seeing. That's where they got that from. But he certainly has agents. For Satan, the construction, the look of Satan, we, we have something here we didn't see before. These horns are kings, a ruling authority, kings. A king is somebody who can make a decree and is given to rule over the people. Just like the seven spirits govern the seven churches, so does Satan's horns. That power given to Satan, it governs many different places. We could say that it's on anything mankind built are the influences of 
of that dragon are ruled by that dragon. That's why Jesus was brought up into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And in one specific spot, Jesus showed him all the kingdoms of the earth in one moment of time. You know what he said? If you bow down and worship me, I'll give all this to you because all this is given into my hand and I can give it to whomever I want. So we know by that scripture in the New Testament that Satan is given power over the kingdoms of this earth. Satan is. And he is the one that will appoint whom he, well, let's just say their, their power is governing every single seat that somebody is going to have to fight against. They're doing something. Something is happening. These ten horns, that authority and power of the dragon itself. And then what does it go and do? It copies itself in the earth. Its spiritual force is very limited all by itself. Because if it wasn't, I'm pretty sure that people would do a whole lot more than what they're doing now. Principalities and powers is spoken to us by the prophets of the New Testament. We war not against the flesh, but of principalities and powers, right? Spiritual wickedness and stuff like that, right? It's what we're dealing with. In what, though? This draconian figure that replicated itself, set itself up in the earth. That's why Jesus said, see, the son of perdition come and he hath nothing in me. Satan is coming and he has nothing in me. He also said, now has come time for the prince of this world to be cast out. So he has no authority and power directly over us anymore. It also is written in the New Testament that Jesus is now the head of all principalities. And he told everybody not to fear. He spoiled them all. All these um, principalities and powers floating all over the place, he utterly destroyed them. Thus, all the mandates went out historically. The dragon, this element you're dealing with in the earth, is what you're dealing with on this natural realm or resistance. While Christ is the spirit in you, and it governs the body of Christ, and if you're truly part of his, those seven spirits of the Lamb, because Jesus now has become the head of all principalities. Now, in this day and age, Satan has lost all power over believers. But all believers are not exercising themselves to get up from where they are. We cannot make an excuse for where we are, but we can stand where we are. Why? Because it is Christ now who has dominion and authority spiritually. And once parts of Revelation come to pass, all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's what the Bible says. Prior to that time, who do they belong to? Satan. That's why they're so corrupted. That's why all of the ways of these nations are corrupted. You know that inside of your gut they are corrupted. And the more you learn about Christ and the more you learn about that structure of the Lamb and you keep that in mind when you're reading about Satan, you're going to, find, you're going to say, wait a minute, Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, I give you power over scorpions and serpents and nothing will by any means hurt you. He's given us all power over the enemy. So these kingdoms of Satan have no authority over you. Only your Savior has authority over you. But if you can ever be convinced that something has authority over you, guess what you're going to do? You're going to maneuver within the confines of whatever limitations they just put upon you. And you won't be free because you're believing a lie. No one who believes a lie can be free. And I'm saying this, folks, because there, there, there's some massive disasters coming. And I'm telling you right now, if this COVID-19 can cause Christians to begin to curse, to begin to act out of character, what do you think will take place when a huge behemoth monstrosity is set up in the earth and it seems to be absorbing everybody's attention like it does now and you can't seem to reach anybody because everybody's paying attention to it and it's intimidating and you're running around scared because you think something is going to get you what do you think you'll be like in that time will you remember the structure and the order of the lord that he has given to the heavens and the earth will you remember that the lord has already authorized a power over you that is stronger than Satan. That he has given you power over all the power of the enemy. You don't entertain darkness. You don't have to entertain all that stuff. You're here to overcome. You're not here to be free of something on your own terms. You're here to overcome all things. That's how you're free of it.